a warm welcome to all who have joined us for worship today. And if you are joining us for the first time, a special welcome. If you're with us each week, welcome back. I thought we might pass the peace this morning, so I invite us, if you're on video, to show the peace sign with your two fingers and those on audio only to also join in the greeting of peace. The peace of the Lord be with you and also with you. Let us join in the call to worship. Breathe upon us, Holy Spirit. And inspire our worship with your truth. Stir in our hearts, Holy Spirit. And, and fill us with your love. Strengthen us, Holy Spirit. And move us to act with your power. Breathe in us, Holy Spirit. And receive our prayers and praise. Today we acknowledge the land with these words. We here at Sharon Hope United Church sit on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and Wendat nations, land covered by the dish with one spoon wampum covenant. We give thanks for their stewardship of the land, and may we continue in that tradition to care for this land for the generations to come. Today, we light the Christ candle to remind us that Christ is with us, that Christ loves us, and the triune God continues to be our peace. Let us join our hearts as we sing the gathering hymn, Voices United 315, Holy, Holy, Holy. Let us pray. 
God of power and possibility. With the flame of your spirit, you give us energy to move into the world in Jesus' name. With the breath of your spirit, you refresh us to engage life in its complexity. Your spirit embraces us in our diversity and invites us to find unity in your love. We honor you for the gift of creation in all its beauty and bounty. We praise you for your presence with us in every time and place. In this time of worship, send us the Holy Spirit once again and renew us to serve you in the world, the world that aches for the healing and wholeness you offer through Jesus Christ, our Lord. God of mystery and mercy, we confess that we have not always paid attention to the urging of your spirit, calling us to follow your will and your way. Too often we claim to belong to Jesus, but choose instead to ignore his teaching. You created us to love you and one another, but we fail to offer your love to those who differ from us. Stir in our hearts and in our lives with your Holy Spirit. Transform who we are and direct who we shall become through Christ's redeeming love. This faithful saying is worthy of our trust and acceptance. In Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. Be at peace with God, with yourself, and with one another. Thanks be to God for God's steadfast love and mercy. Amen. As we prepare to listen to the readings of scripture, we will listen to the, to the song, More Voices 13, Let the Power Fall on Me. reading this morning is from Romans chapter 8 verses 12 to 17 and I'm reading from the message a little more modern version of the scripture. So don't you see that we don't owe this old do-it-yourself life one red cent. There's nothing in it for us, nothing at all. The best thing to do is to give it a decent burial and get on with your new life. God's spirit beckons. There are things to do and places to go. This resurrection life you receive from God is not a timid, grave-tending life. It's adventurously expectant, greeting God with a childlike, what's next, Papa? God's spirit touches our spirits and confirms who we really are. We know who he is, and we know who we are, father and children. And we know we are going to get what's coming to us, an unbelievable inheritance. We go through exactly what Christ goes through. If we go through the hard times with him, then we are certainly going to go through the good times with him. And our gospel reading is from John chapter 3. This is the story of Nicodemus visiting with Jesus. Now, there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. 
Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, how can anyone be born after growing old? No one can one enter a second time into mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses. You hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you a teacher of Israel and you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I had told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the son of man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the son of man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. May we have understanding of these holy scriptures. Our hymn of preparation, Voices United 376, Spirit of the Living God. Holy Spirit, open our ears, our minds, and hearts so that we encounter God's living word in the scriptures. May that word change our hearts and inform our actions in the example of Christ our Lord. Amen. The Gospel of John captures an interesting exchange between a Pharisee named Nicodemus, who was a member of the ruling Jewish council. The Nicodemus was a representative of the leadership at the time. That the same leadership who were seeking to discredit Jesus and who 
we know will succeed in gathering the momentum they need to set Jesus up for crucifixion. Like any other group of people, whether in leadership or otherwise, there are always a few within that group who understand the vision and mission and whose heart has been transformed or captured by the ministry such that they give themselves wholeheartedly to it, even to the surprise of other members of their group. Nicodemus seems to be one of those people. John tells us that he comes to see Jesus by night, obviously to prevent people from seeing him for this action would throw doubt on the council. Nicodemus begins the exchange by articulating what he knows is the council's position. He says, they know that Jesus is a teacher like, like no other. He is a teacher who has come from God. They know that because of what Jesus has done so far, all the signs that he has, that has followed him, that, and so far they have all shown that God is with him. But I invite you to notice that Jesus does not acknowledge the direction of the conversation. Instead, Jesus exposes the underlying issue. It is not enough to know about Jesus. It is not a, enough to simply follow the principles of Jesus because that is what good Christian people do. In the book, Marks of New Birth, the author says, the true living Christian faith, which whosoever has is born of God, is not only an asset, an act of understanding, it is also a disposition which God has brought on the person's heart, a sure trust and confidence in God that through the merits of Christ, the sins will be forgiven and the person will be reconciled to the favor of God. So what that means is yes, the Christian faith is born of God and it is through an encounter with the true and living God that we come to know Christ and come to choose Christ as our standard bearer and guide to living a life that pleases God. But there is more. As we practice the principles that Jesus taught, the belief and the action must transform us. Our faith must be more than an assent, more than an agreement that these are the right things to do or think or say. It must become a disposition. It must change us at the heart level. It must make us different. Different people, different thinking, different attitude, different way of living and being in the world. Like Nicodemus, we must ask ourselves of the how many years we have been a part of the church, being a part of a faith community, doing what church people do, what difference has it made on me? The reality is, if we were to assess the amount of change in us, at being a part of the church as we have. Some of us would find that we are a two-year-old Christian inside of a 40-year-old body. So here is the first question for you to reflect on this week. Thinking about your faith, how much have you changed since you started practicing your faith? And how old are you, really? Are you still an infant? Are you still a child? Are you still a teenager? Are you an emerging adult or a maturing adult? As part of that assessment, ask the people around you if they have seen a change in your disposition since you became a part of the church. And if they say, not really friends, and something is missing. 
what you find will give you some ideas about what it is like to journey with you in the faith. Jesus's response brought Nicodemus Demos face to face with this truth. How long you have been on this journey is not as important as how much this journey has made you a better person. Are you more loving, more patient, kinder? Do you have more self-control? Are you more forgiving? Are you less of a warrior? Are you enduring challenges with grace and not losing your cool easily? I can say that one of the major changes I've seen in myself over the years is my development of self-control. And I no longer say what I'm thinking without thinking. I would have been described years ago as having a very sharp tongue. When we are created, when we were created, God applied a three-pronged approach to seeking to guide the human will. The Old Testament shows that rules alone do not transform the human will towards godliness. What Peter refers to in Romans 12 as the flesh, the flesh cannot be transformed by rules not rules alone. The human will is stubborn. Your will is stubborn, and so is mine. Both the Old Testament and the Gospels tell us that experience with God alone does not transform the human will towards godliness either. God's self came down in the person of Jesus and sought to show us through signs and teaching how to live a life pleasing to God. And there were still a group of people, both leaders and followers, even among Jesus' disciples who did not get it. And we know how that unfolded. The human will is stubborn. Your will is stubborn and so is mine. The Pentecostal period, though, revealed that it is in combination. Principles to live by, a human example to follow, and the human experience can transform the human will. That is what Paul meant by being led by the Spirit. Holy Spirit, power divine, Fill and nerve this heart, this will of mine. Boldly may I always live, bravely serve and gladly give. It is through an ongoing communion with the triune God, the Trinity, that we can become what Jesus uses as born again. For surely, we cannot enter a second time into our mother's womb to be born. That would not help, even if it were possible. Because as Jesus points out, flesh gives birth to flesh. Our human wills would still be the same way, stubborn, difficult, hard of hearing, like a child. Our will has to be tempered, shaped, and channeled in order for us to become the individual that either makes a difference in the world in a positive way or wreaks havoc on the world. We must be reborn. We must be made anew. And that rebirth comes from the power of the Holy Spirit being given full control of our being and through experience and teaching, allowing ourselves to be changed into the way that God would like us to be. And that means a change in disposition, how we think, how we behave, how we treat people, how we relate to the divine. Jesus explains that he is the turning point for change. He says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the son of man be lifted up that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. 
The story of Moses lifting up the serpent in the wilderness is found in Numbers chapter 21, verses 4 to 9, if you're interested in reading it. And in that story, the people were in the wilderness still, and they had sinned, and they were being bitten by snakes and dying. So they went to Moses for help, and God told Moses to make a bronze serpent and tie it to a pole and raise it in the center of the village. And anyone who looked at the snake would live. That's the story that Jesus is referring to. The interesting fact is today we still use that snake wrapped around the pole in medicine. I wonder if you recall where you've seen it last. It's often used in the symbol for pharmacy to convey the idea of healing. But Jesus used this story to point to the salvation story, that people are in danger of death because of sin. The agent of salvation is provided by God. First, the bronze serpent, and then Jesus. Both are lifted up before the people, the bronze serpent on the pole and Jesus on the cross. And by looking and believing in God's agent of salvation, people were saved. Two differences, however. Unlike Jesus, the bronze snake was only a piece of bronze and had no saving power in itself. And secondly, looking at the bronze snake extended physical life, while looking to Jesus gives us life that extends beyond the physical to the eternal. What Jesus was getting to was the honest acknowledgement that we are difficult people to deal with, not just you and I, but humanity in general. No testimony, no sign or wonder, not even a global pandemic can change some people's will. No matter the chronological age, many people still have the will of a two-year-old. What Jesus was getting to was the fact that the only one thing could cause someone to continue to pursue a people who seem committed to do what they want, even to their own harm. And that is love. For God so loved the world, an emphasis on the word so. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send God's son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And I like how it is articulated in the message that Lori read this morning. This is how much God loved the world. God gave his son, his one and only son. And this is why, so that no one need be destroyed by believing in him, anyone can have a whole and lasting life. God didn't go to all the trouble of sending his son merely to point an accusing finger, telling the world how bad it was. He came to help, to put the world right again. And anyone who trusts in him is acquitted. The word so there, as I said in the message in the yield blast, shows there are other options that God could have chosen. But the depth and extent and intensity of God's love for us only allowed God to save us by sending Jesus, the son to be lifted so that anyone who believes, anyone who is willing to be free of their stubbornness, anyone who desires to be in control of their will can do that with the help of the Holy Spirit and that help is what is needed to experience the kingdom of God on earth and the kingdom of heaven when we die. This is what makes love radical, that it pursues when it is rejected, that it covers a multitude of sins, 1 Peter 4 verse 8, 
that it bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. First Corinthians 13, 7 and 8. The church of today continues to have the challenge of engaging the human will, of working with the Trinity to help people to transform themselves and their lives by bringing their wills under control. Practicing radical love will enable us to connect with the people that God is trying to reach. Practicing radical love as Jesus demonstrates it will allow us to show people the difference between a love driven by the flesh and one driven by the spirit. The Holy Spirit enables us to practice this radical love by first softening our hearts with it. You are the church of today. And today is a good time as any to be born anew, to begin to allow the spirit to change you into the best person that God intended. And if you already done the math of your age question and realize you're much younger than you thought you were in faith terms, God's love for you, which is beyond any measure, gives you the opportunity to ask and will respond. Just ask. Holy Spirit, love divine, glow within this heart of mine. Kindle every heart desire, purify me with your fire. Our faith should change us. We should be better people by it. And if we are, then we have work to do. For Jesus says, you must be born again. You must be made anew. You must be a different person from the person you were when you began to communicate and journey with the church 30, 40, 50, 60, or two years ago. You must be different. We must be different. And if we think about all the ways that the church has impacted the world, we recognize that people are looking for something different. And they will only find it if we who present as the body of Christ in the world show difference in the way we practice our love radically and openly. Amen. We will give thanks for the gifts we have received. Praise our maker, Voices United, 316. is 
at Pentecost, God poured out gifts of the Spirit upon the church to equip Christ's followers to be a witness to him throughout the world. We offer our gifts and our lives to God so that the witness of the church will continue with the blessing of the Holy Spirit in this generation and beyond. Let us pray. Pierce, you're muted. I pushed that twice, I sure did. Spirit of grace and power, bless the gifts we offer so that they accomplish surprising things in Jesus' name. Bless our lives too, so that our words and actions may bear witness to Jesus' love and mercy each and every day. Amen. As we lift up our prayers of intercession today, we will sing Voices United 320, Mother in God. Let us pray. Wind of the Spirit, blow through us and your whole church on this day of Pentecost. Blow through us and renew our faith. Reawaken our love for God. Let your flames warm our hearts with trust in Jesus Christ and dare us to do great things in his name. Wind of the Spirit, blow through us and renew our faith. Wind of the Spirit, blow through us and give us energy to serve you as the body of Christ working in the world. Open our eyes to recognize needs for ministry and mission around us. Open our hearts to welcome newcomers and meet those we do not yet know. Open our hands to share in tasks that need doing and open our lips in prayer and praise. Wind of the Spirit, Blow through us and renew our energy to serve. Wind of the Spirit, blow through us and give us understanding for all those whose lives seem so different from ours. For those facing situations we've never encountered. For those with whom we've disagreed. For problems and challenges we face at home, at work, and in the world still struggling with the effects of the pandemic. Wind of the Spirit, blow through us and give us new understanding. Wind of the Spirit, blow through us and bring healing to all who face pain or illness, discouragement or disappointment. For all who know sorrow, sadness, or grief. For those who face stress and pressure. Wind of the Spirit, blow through us and bring healing and peace. In particular, we lift up in our prayers today those who are still recovering from COVID-19, 
for those who work in the field, helping or hospitals, in the grocery stores and other essential services. For those who have lost loved ones, their source of income or a relationship, we lift up those who are struggling with daily life of isolation. In particular today, our hearts are heavy as we mourn the 215 children found at the former residential school. This news is a stark reminder of the violence inflicted by the residential school system and the wounds carried by communities and families and survivors into the present. Great Spirit, Truth Divine, we know that nothing that is evil can remain unhidden. And so as we face this truth, give us the grace, the understanding, and the willingness to, and the ability to heal. Through Christ we pray. Wind of the Spirit, blow through us and bring us the compassion we see in Christ Jesus. Blow through us and equip us to serve the world you love in his name. Blow through us and refresh us as your faithful followers. Unite us across our differences as together we pray the words Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our closing hymn, Voices United 8-7, I am the light of the world.
If you follow and love, you will learn the mystery of what you are meant to do and be. Receive the blessing. Lord, as we go from this place, walk with us. Give us renewed confidence in your will and transform our lives that we may serve you better by sharing God's radical love with the world and with each other. Amen. Take up this song. Have a good week.